The capitalist revolution turned a society rooted in the soil into one based in cities. They lifted the standard of ordinary people to a plane associated with aristocracy. A secret of success was its ability to harness the strength and skill of armies of men and women to their capitalist purpose. Yet for all the advances in material life, there remained a feeling that things had gone wrong, a screw had come loose, and the wheels fallen out of balance. Prosperity was precarious, as the crisis revealed. Inequality was more obvious than ever. The capitalists controlled the government. In this passage from American Colossus, historian H.W. Brands was describing America's Gilded Age from 1865 to 1900, but he could just as well have been describing present-day China. Once the dates and names in 19th century American history are removed, the parallels between that period and post-1978 China are striking. Both share a dramatic story of renewal after devastation and prosperity amid decadence. The term gilded, not to be confused with golden, means that beneath the precious glittering surface lies a hard base metal. America is now also experiencing a partial repeat of the 19th century Gilded Age, except the formal titans of capitalism in steel and railroads have been replaced by behemoths in high finance and technology. Globalization did not deliver on its promise of prosperity for all Americans. Instead, the outsourcing of production to countries like China profited multinational companies while hollowing out industrial towns. During the 2008 financial crisis, elites on Wall Street received bailouts from government, while people on Main Street lost their jobs and savings. Exploiting popular discontent, Trump parachuted into the presidential race in 2016 with rallying cries to bring jobs back home and drain the swamp. And to everyone's surprise, he won. Contrary to popular cultural tropes, America and China today are not caught in a clash of civilizations. Rather, we are witnessing a curious form of great power competition, the clash of two gilded ages. Both the U.S. and China confront sharp inequality, corruption or capture of state power by economic elites and persistent financial risk. Both are struggling to reconcile the tensions between capitalism and their respective political systems, albeit with greater intensity in China's nominally communist system. Both US President Biden and Chinese President Xi have staked their legacy on ending the excesses of capitalism, except under different banners. Whereas Biden pledges to build back better, Xi dubs his campaign common prosperity. To say that the US and China are similar, however, does not mean that they are identical. America is a democracy with constitutional protections of individual freedoms, whereas China is a top-down system ruled by one party. Thus, the two countries are pursuing progressive reforms very differently. At the turn of the 20th century, when America was an emerging industrial power, its society fought graft and inequality through political activism, civil service reforms, new regulations, and by voting corrupt politicians out of office. Today, facing a deindustrialized economy and outdated infrastructure, Biden's agenda is focused on passing legislation on large public investment and raising taxes on corporations. Xi, on the other hand, is trying to stamp out capitalist excesses through commands and campaigns to punish graft, eliminate poverty, and rein in what he calls the chaotic expansion of capital. Like Biden, Xi aspires for fairer development, 
but with the Communist Party firmly in control. For a personification of the American Gilded Age, there is no better candidate than Mr. Leland Stanford. The railroad robber baron who would eventually endow the university that bears his name. Stanford entered into business serendipitously. After his law firm burned down in a fire, he moved to California and co-founded one of the largest railroad companies in America, the Central Pacific Railroad. Connecting the east and west coasts of the United States by a transcontinental railroad was a revolutionary business that along with his directorships of Wells Fargo Bank and the Pacific Mutual Life Insurance Company, that eventually made Stanford one of the richest men of his time. Constructing railroads was both expensive and risky, thus government support was indispensable. In 1861, just months after he founded the Central Pacific, Stanford was elected governor of California. Upon taking office, he badgered the state legislature into investing millions in public funds into railroad construction. Then, offering bribes and shares of the Central Pacific in bulging suitcases, Stanford's associates convinced politicians to pass laws that would maximize their company's profit while transferring the risk of failure to taxpayers. This culminated in the 1862 Railroad Act that granted railroad companies their wish list. To cut costs, Central Pacific imported coolies from China, contract laborers who worked for dirt cheap wages and had no rights. When these workers staged a strike demanding a raise and safer conditions, management starved them into submission. Many Americans assume that capitalism and democracy are natural, happy companions. American leaders see themselves as champions of both free markets and political liberty. Yet capitalism and democracy have always coexisted in tension in the U.S., as the historian H.W. Brands writes, democracy depends on equality, capitalism on inequality. Citizens in a democracy come to the public square with one vote each. Participants in a capitalist economy arrive at a marketplace with unequal talents and resources and leave the marketplace with unequal rewards. Individual drive for profit and gain is the engine of capitalism, but that drive can also lead to greed and corruption. Rising to the top doesn't necessarily require better products and services. Instead, favorable laws, government handouts, tax breaks, and regulatory exemptions can do just as well. The theme behind the stories of the Gilded Age is the triumph of capitalism over democracy. Capitalists were able to buy government. Sometimes the capitalists were the government. Laden with political advantages, they exploited labor, monopolized markets, and took excessive risk. Over the course of the 19th century, America suffered not one, but five financial panics, all linked to speculative investment, overvalued stocks, and reckless debt. Eventually, the simmering troubles of the Gilded Age could not be ignored. Discontented groups from various parts of society, some radical, some moderate, launched social movements across the country. The emerging working class waged strikes demanding labor rights, which were violently suppressed by their capitalist employers. To improve governance, middle-class progressives, on the other hand, push for civil service professionalization, anti-monopoly regulations, health and safety regulations, restrictions on corporate contributions to political campaigns, tax reforms, and more. Market-raking journalists and transparency initiatives also expose corruption. This set of wide-ranging economic and political reforms came to be known as the U.S. Progressive Era, which lasted roughly from the 1890s to the 1920s. Progressives, road brands, were the 
democratic skeptics of capitalism. On the one hand, capitalism raised standards of living for millions of Americans and turned America into the most attractive emerging economy for European investors at the time. It was the 19th century equivalent of contemporary China. On the other hand, the unchecked forces of capitalism threatened to splinter society and destabilize the economy. It became time for democracy to reassert its authority. The captains of industry who have driven the railway systems across this continent, who have built up our commerce, who have developed our manufacturers, have on the whole done great good to our people, said President Theodore Roosevelt, who launched a new age of progressive reforms. But he continued, great corporations exist only because they are created and safeguarded by our institutions. And it is therefore our right and our duty to see that they work in harmony with these institutions. More than a century later, and across the Pacific, the leader of another capitalist juggernaut would utter similar words, this time under the rule of a communist party. If Stanford's dominance in politics and business captures the American Gilded Age, then his equivalent in China would be a duo who represent the asymmetrical marriage of power and money. Bo Xilai is a modern-day princeling. His father, Bo Yibo, was one of the pioneers of the Communist Party, rehabilitated by Deng after Mao died to steer China's market opening as vice premier. While other senior party bureaucrats were colorless and recited speeches in monotone, Bo Xilai stood out for his good looks, charm, and flamboyance. The BBC described him as the nearest thing China has to a Western-style politician. From 2007, Bo was the Provincial Party Secretary of Chongqing, a southwestern backwater. There, he rolled out a populist agenda with great fanfare, deploying welfare benefits for the poor, state investment, Maoist songs, and crackdowns on crime. At the height of his popularity, Bo was a contender for the top post in the party. But after a shocking turn of events in 2012, Bo was ousted for corruption and sent to prison. Xi came to power amid this scandal. Public trials of Bo's corruption revealed the supporting role of his capitalist henchman, Xu Ming. For years, Xu financed the lavish lifestyles of Bo's family and in return received lucrative government contracts and generous loans from state banks. At its peak, the business activities of his conglomerate spanned construction, sports, finance, and real estate. In 2005, Forbes named Xu the eighth richest person in China, with an estimated net worth of $1 billion. When Bo fell from power, however, Xu was arrested with him and died mysteriously in prison shortly after his release. The great mystery of China's rise isn't simply a question of how China became rich. Rather, it is a more vexing question of how China became rich despite rampant corruption, as evident from numerous scandals like Bo's and Xu's. If we believe the conventional wisdom that corruption impedes growth and that Western economies like the US and UK prospered by first eradicating corruption and establishing good accountable institutions, then China appears to be a gigantic outlier. In fact, if China is exceptional, it is only as exceptional as the real American experience not the partial myths and glorified narratives presented in mainstream political economy. As the economist Ha Jun Cheng pleaded, institutional economists need to pay more attention to the real world, both of the present and historical, 
not the fairy tale retelling of the history of the world that has come to characterize mainstream institutional economics today, from the glorious revolution to the Botswana political culture, but capitalism as it really has been. According to renowned economists Daron Asamoglu and Jim Robinson, authors of Why Nations Fail, American capitalism flourished because European migrants brought inclusive and non-extractive institutions from Europe to North American soil. It should therefore be no surprise, they concluded, that it was U.S. society, not Mexico or Peru, that produced Thomas Edison. Because economic institutions that encourage private property, uphold contracts, and create a level playing field fostered innovation and growth, they said. But a recap of the history of America's Gilded Age reveals a very different reality. Sure, a small section of society, namely elite white men, enjoyed secure property rights, while Native Americans, slaves in the South, indentured laborers from China, migrants, and women were excluded. Even among the privileged, it was no level playing field. Robert Barons, like Stanford, publicly championed free market principles while privately benefiting from state-supplied privileges and protection. And yet, American capitalism boomed for reasons similar to China's a particular type of corruption came to dominate the economy. That is what I call access money, the purchase of privileges by capitalists from those in power. This transactional form of corruption must be distinguished from extractive corruption, such as embezzlement, extortion, and petty bribery. The latter existed during the early stages of capitalism in both America and China, but they were steadily brought under control through administrative reforms and increased state capacity. Access money, on the other hand, exploded in both cases. Xi inherited a gilded age from his predecessors. While China is no longer impoverished as a whole, it suffers the ailments of a richer, crony capitalist economy. In thick party speak, the Communist Party's historic revolution in 2021 acknowledged. Although market liberalization has made historical strides in raising the living standards of people from bare subsistence to moderate prosperity, China faces no small number of long, unresolved, deep-seated problems, as well as newly emerging problems. In particular, Xi believes it is time to rein in the chaotic expansion of private free markets. Capital is a critical component of the socialist market economy, he pronounced in a speech in April 2022. But today, the Communist Party must regulate and guide the healthy development of capital because this concerns, in his words, the quality of development and common prosperity, as well as national security and social stability. If the American progressives at the turn of the 20th century were democratic skeptics of capitalism, then Xi is an authoritarian skeptic of capitalism. He sees his historic mission as summoning China out of the Gilded Age and into a red progressive era using the tools of Leninism, commands, and campaigns. For him, the end goal is not only to correct social inequality, but also to preserve the CCP's grip on power, even as China becomes more affluent. Upon taking office in 2012, she has in fact launched a platform of red progressivism, even though he did not call it that. That began with his anti-corruption drive, the largest in the party's history, and his poverty eradication campaign. In 2021, baffled observers thought the Communist Party's crackdown on big private companies and rich celebrities came out of nowhere and seemed to be self-sabotaging. 
In fact, it was a logical extension of Xi's red progressivism. If the Chinese economy seems precarious, the situation in America today is no better. Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Says reported a troubling pattern of rising income and wealth concentration in the U.S. since progressive taxation was cut back in the 1980s. In 1970, the top 0.01 percent earned 50 times more than average income. In 1998, that number jumped to 250 times. As inequality rises, social mobility falls. The share of 30 years old who made more money than their parents did at that age dropped from 92% in 1970 to 50% in 2010. According to a survey by Pew Research in 2021, 68% of U.S. respondents believe that today's children will be worse off as adults than their parents. These are the conditions that precipitated the rise of Donald Trump. Altogether, it is fair to say that the U.S. has entered a Gilded Age, with some parallels to the past, but also notable differences. Unlike in the 19th century, America today is an advanced, post-industrialized economy not an emerging one. It no longer enjoys the freedom of rebuilding from a blank slate. Instead, it is hobbled by a heavy baggage of accumulated regulations, political deals, and vested interests. Gridlocked and captured by narrow interest groups, the U.S. government struggles to deliver essential public goods that serve national interests, most notably infrastructure. The once enterprising nation that built a transcontinental railroad is now barely able to repair the crapid Amtrak trains. For the Biden administration, convincing American citizens and lawmakers to abandon the neoliberal doctrine and take big government action is an imperative. Writing in the New York Times, Ezra Klein applies the term supply-side progressivism. Instead of meeting the needs of citizens only through welfare and individual aid, the U.S. government, he argues, should increase the supply of necessary goods and services. Not only the ones needed today, but also those that would prepare American society for the future. Writing in Foreign Affairs in 1993, political scientist Samuel Huntington claimed, the great divisions among humankind and the dominating source of conflict will be cultural. Civilizations are differentiated from each other by history, language, culture, tradition, and most important, religion. In conflicts between civilizations, the question is, what are you? That is a given that cannot be changed. After Trump took office in 2016, his administration revived this set of ideas to frame U.S.-China competition. Kieran Skinner, then director of policy planning at the State Department, said, This is a fight with a really different civilization and a different ideology. And the United States hasn't had that before. It's the first time that we will have a great power competitor that is not Caucasian. The appeal of the clash of civilizations is understandable, but dangerous. It is a fact that American and Chinese society have different languages, traditions, and political systems. Huntington's notion of civilizations, however, posits an identity that people inherit from birth, and that, in his words, cannot be changed. This provides a fancy camouflage for claiming that people of different races, Caucasians versus non-Caucasians, as Skinner's words imply, are destined to be divided and eventually clash. In fact, the answer to what are you can be changed. And nowhere is this more true than in the United States, a democratic, multi-ethnic nation. The Statue of Liberty symbolizes not only freedom and justice, but also the welcoming of immigrants who seek hope 
and opportunity. Early settlers who came from Europe were also migrants. Indians were the natives. Believing that what are you cannot be changed means rejecting the American dream and values. Even in the so-called civilization state of China, what are you has evolved over thousands of years. The geographic boundaries of China change from dynasty to dynasty, regional identities solidified and melted away. Understanding U.S.-China relations as the clash of two Gilded Ages has important implications. The two great rivals can and do share similarities, though they are never identical. Their different political systems lead to starkly different responses to the problems of a Gilded Age. As the leader of a democracy, Biden must win bipartisan and public support to pass his progressive policies. American civil society is freely and fiercely debating alternatives to the current political economic model. In China, by contrast, Xi has imposed a series of rate progressive campaigns from the top. What China's future should be is decided by him and Communist Party leaders. The rest of China must obey and follow. Ultimately, the contest between the U.S. and China is not about who will sabotage and outrun the other. The greatest crises facing each country are self-inflicted. No foreign competitor can desecrate the U.S. Capitol and undermine democratic principles the way Trump's fanatical mob did on January 6, 2021. No foreign rival can make China impose a zero-COVID policy that crippled the economy even after the virus mutated and became less severe. The shared challenge between America and China is reshaping and managing capitalism. If there is a race, whichever nation wins is the one who avoids self-inflicted wounds and makes capitalism work for the common good rather than for a small sliver of super elites.